I'm delighted to welcome back Richard Sanders, senior producer on the Libra Files, to ask him uh, some more important questions. Welcome back to Palestine Deep Dive, Richard. It's great Thank to you. have you with us once more. Thank you for having me, Ahmed. Thank you. So firstly, I would like to begin by asking you about how have you found the reception of the Libra Files since we last spoke? Has there been any more interest from the mainstream media? And if not, why do you think that is? Well, it's no, there hasn't really been any more. Uh, John Ware, who presented the panorama that we criticized, has written a very lengthy piece um, contesting, I mean, really only a part of one of the four allegations we made about that panorama program. Uh, so that's happened. Other than that, no, it continues to be almost in, entirely um, ignored. Um, one or two people have tweeted about it, but the, the mainstream media has to, is just treating it as if it didn't happen. But we're talking about the biggest leaks of uh, documents in the British history. Like it was a huge leaks, a huge uh, accusations. And wh why do you think no one cared to uh, mention or? Oh, well, I think there are, there are various reasons. Obviously, the Labour Party is very keen for no one to talk about this. Also, really, our series is quite critical of the British media. <laughs> so the British media isn't terribly keen to talk about it either. But also, as you probably know, there's been this enormous political crisis here in Britain. Um, the, the government has changed yet again. Uh, and the, gov the, the Labour Party is riding high. It's... Um, you know, feeling very triumphalist at the moment. So I, I think it's not a great moment. I think people aren't particularly interested in raking over the coals of the um, Corbyn era right now. Well, thank you very much, Richard. So something uh, which I found particularly moving for me as a Palestinian who was working on the ground as a journalist in Gaza during the March of Return was the footage you included in the documentary, connecting the dots between what was happening there uh, on the ground and what is happening here in the UK in the Labour Party during that period. In the documentary, you interviewed Dr. Ghada Karmi and Huda Amouri about this. And from, uh, and from what you show, it seems to me that while I was there dodging bullets fired from Israel as snipers, and indeed, while I was, while I saw younger children murdered before my eyes as they peacefully protested their imprisonment in Gaza, the Labour Party was actually investigating some of its members who were speaking out against such violence. Can I ask you why, why uh, do you feel it, it was important for you to include Palestinian voices such as Huda's and Dr. Ghada Karmi's in your series? Yes, yeah, so throughout uh, this period, you know, even during the period when Jeremy Corbyn was not just leader of the Labour Party, but also had control of the Labour Party bureaucracy, even during that period, the Labour Party's disciplinary processes and its anti-racist spotlight was shone firmly away from a state which all of the world's leading human rights organisations agree is an apartheid state, Israel. It was, it was shining away from that and towards its victims. Um, this seemed to me to be outrageous. Um, I was very keen to make use of footage of Palestine and to talk about Palestine. Um, I think that during the whole anti-Semitism debate in the Labour Party, Palestine was somehow absent. Um, the, the context of Palestine was removed altogether. So people, Palestinian activists, pro-Palestinian activists, comments and quotes were often used against them, um, which appeared to come out of nowhere. Um, if you don't have the Palestinian context, people's anger and passion can, can, is, is harder to understand. Whereas when you're putting them in the context of events in, in Palestine, particularly during the summer of 2018, the spring and summer in 2018, and the Great March of Return, it's suddenly, at the very least, provides an alternative explanation for their passion and anger other than anti-Semitism. Well, thank you very much. Richard, in your um, in our previous interview with you, you mentioned how the conversation should really be about Zionism and anti-Zionism all along, rather than uh, focused on anti-Semitism. Can you please elaborate more on that? 
Well, I think that's right, because when you look at what people are being attacked for saying, it is almost always to do with Zionism or to do with Israel, or perhaps to do with the Labour Party's disciplinary procedures. Very, very rarely were people being um, disciplined for sort of conventional, old-fashioned, as it were, anti-Semitism. Now, the argument always was that, ah, they say Israel, they say Zionism, but they mean Jews. And on occasions, that may be true. And we, we found examples in the disciplinary files where that, that did seem to be true. But, but very rarely was any attempt made to, to prove this point. So effectively, Corbyn's critics were appropriating to themselves the right to say, ah, you mean Israel, you mean um, Zionism, but what you really, you're, that's what you're saying, but what you really mean is Jews. This obviously massively disempowers Palestinians and acts as a, a shield um, to the Israeli state. And in, in fact, what people were very often being attacked for was for questioning the basic tenets of Zionism as put into practice. If you take the view that, that Zionism as put into practice is an ideology of ethnic hegemony, it is a state whose defining feature um, is that it's structured to ensure the domination of one ethnicity over another, then the whole debate feels completely different. And my feeling was that that, that is actually what we need to be talking about. And, and that's the debate that needs to be being had. And, and as I said before, while we're having the debate about anti-Semitism, it means we're not having the debate about Zionism. In a, in a sense, there is, there is a, in Britain, in America, in Western Europe generally, there is a blind spot about Zionism. There's a blind spot for very understandable reasons. I think Europeans find it very difficult to view Israel through anything other than the prism of the Jewish experience in Europe. And, and, in, and it's understandable they should do that. In, do, in, in, doing, in so doing, they rather neglect seeing it from the Palestinian perspective. And I think what, what Palestinian activists are trying to do in Europe is to remove that blind spot, to show clearly what the nature of the, the Israeli state is and so on. And um, I think a lot of what has happened over the last six years is a determined attempt to prevent them from refocusing that analysis of Israel, that vision of Israel. Oh, thank you. What seems apparent to me is that many people in the UK, even those well-meaning on the left, don't really understand the meaning uh, of the word Zionism and how it relates to the facts uh, on the ground in Palestine. For instance, in 2020, during the Labour leadership campaign, I am told that Rebecca Long Bailey, the candidate who was uh, considered Corbyn's left-wing replacement, openly stated she was a Zionist, in turn alienating much of the left and, of course, the Palestinians. But surely us Palestinians who have endured ongoing siege, occupation, house demolitions, lost loved ones, this illegal incarceration, and so much more, should be the ones uh, to be asked to define what is the true meaning of Zionism. After all, Israel, as a self-declared Zionist entity, is a manifestation of such an ideology. And we have been at the sharp end of its oppression for decades. So do you feel that Palestinians are best placed to define what Zionism really means? And do you feel that Palestinian voices are heard or respected by the Labour Party today? Palestinian voices are not heard and respected uh, by the Labour Party today. And I think it's clearly the case that Palestinians are the world experts on Zionism. I mean, they're the ones who've had a direct experience of it for the last 80 years. I think, you know, the whole, the whole business of what is referred to as the new anti-Semitism, which is basically to draw an equivalence between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, and this is done through the IHRA definition and so on, has been incredibly effective. It effectively, in Britain, and I think to a degree in America and other Euro European countries, it is impossible to use the word Zionist and Zionism. It has come to acquire these terribly sinister connotations. And I think 
think people have succeeded in, in imposing the view that when people say Zionist or Zionism, they mean Jews. And I've, yeah, of course, that's massively disempowering for, for Palestinians. I always say to people, imagine trying to combat apartheid uh, in South Africa in the 1980s without being allowed to use the word apartheid. Yeah. Well, this is very sad to hear. And so an another angle we we come on to is that after much internal and external pressure, Corbyn adopted the International Holocaust Remembrance, uh, Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism as Labour Party policy in 2018. So it's in, uh, since its inception, many Palestinians have raised concerns about the IHRA definition and its listed examples, as it effectively silences us when it comes to articulating the full nature of our oppression at the hands of the Israeli ongoing violence uh, towards us. For example, 122 Palestinians and Arab academics, journalists and intellectuals expressed their concern about its adoption in an open letter published in The Guardian in 2020 saying, through examples that it provides the IHRA definition conflates Judaism with Zionism in assuming that all Jews are Zionists, and that the state of Israel in its current reality embodies the self-determination of all Jews. Even the drafter of this definition, Kenneth Stern, has said it is now being wielded as a weapon. But for some, including Labour's Luke Erkhurst, the party's adoption of the definition still isn't enough. Erkhurst sits on uh, Labour's uh, ruling National Executive Committee and who is director of the campaign called We Believe in Israel, whose recent, whose recent campaigns, by the way, includes supporting Israeli airstrikes in Gaza and a petition against the uh, uh, author Sally Rooney for her support for BDS movement. He recently tweeted, I'm quoting, happy to confirm that I don't believe people who oppose the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism should be allowed to be Labour parliamentary candidates. Watering to, uh, wanting to water down the definition to some kinds of anti-Semitism are deemed okay isn't compatible with being a Labour candidate. So, Let's look at one of the specific examples listed under the IHRA definition, which reads denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. As a Palestinian myself and as a Palestinian from Gaza, how can I sign up to this? Of course, we Palestinians regard the creation of a state built on the rubble of Palestinian homes as racist. About 700 50,000 Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from their homes during the Nakba, or a catastrophe, as we, uh, as we call it in 1948, when Israel established itself. When Israel claims it must contain itself as a Jewish state, what that means in practice is engineering a Jewish majority and preventing us Palestinians from returning home. And today, Israel's colonial project continues on the ground, forcing Palestinians from their homes and imprisoning two million of us in Gaza. So there isn't a state of Israel. There is only this state of Israel. And we should start dealing with the realities, not the abstract ideals of people's imagination. And that reality is a racist one. This definition takes away my ability as a Palestinian to describe my own lived realities and history accurately. So Richard, doesn't this make the IHRA definition in itself racist toward Palestinians? And if so, given the Labour Party has given that the Labour Party has adopted it, can the party really be committed to combating all forms of racism as Keir Starmer, the current leader, claims? I, mean, I think you've put it very articulately um, yourself there. Um, it was very striking that the whole campaign um, relentlessly led towards the adoption of the IHRA definition. There's huge pressure on the Labour Party um, to adopt that and then not to have any free speech caveats. And, and you quite rightly home in on Article 7, which is essentially... Um, denies Palestinians the right to articulate their own history. And I think this goes back to the, the, the point I made about the West having a blind spot about the nature of um, Israel. You know, Israel 
in practice is a racist ethnostate masquerading as, as, as a Western democracy. And um, article, clause, example seven of the IHRA definition event basically forbids people from pointing that out. Well, thank you very much, Richard. It's been great to speak with you.